driving along the road is my time to be able to think and reflect on many things that have gone on in Aboriginal affairs um, that I've been directly involved with um, oh, since I guess I left Walgut in and, and I suppose while I was in Walgut from 70, 65 onwards. But overall, the thing that has always, I suppose, frustrated efforts to really clear think about all the efforts that we made in terms of uh, trying to revolutionise the process that will bring about social justice and reforms to Aboriginal people and to get back what it is that was forced to be taken from us and that's our inherent sovereign rights as a people um, but more importantly more importantly it's about identity it's about who we are I hear a lot of people say you know we got to get back to who we were well then I find that statement um, a little bit confronting because I've never lost who I was, ever. I am who I am, I always will be. That person who was born into this world as a member of the First Nations peoples, and in my case, a descendant, a direct descendant of bloodline that connects me to Gumroy and Yualiai on my mother's side and my father's side. And so, um, in the middle there, in all honesty, there's an admixture of Irish and Scottish. But, according to government records, when I looked at it, in terms of defining my classification, in the world of um, human society, they brand me as a 5 8 Aborigine on the paperwork in government records in Sydney. And in the, on the bottom of those records, it says 5 8 Aborigine is classified by definition under New South Wales law as a full blood strange but they're the record but anyway so when you think about that uh, classification of blood and your descent um, is concerning because I guess they're trying to quantify what your rights are as a first nation person that in itself is quite worrying. But nonetheless, no matter what quantity of blood one has, it's about you, the, the individual, about you, the person, and how you feel. And of course, there are those of us who grew up supervision by state police as protectors. But growing up on missions was in fact a bit of a dilemma for many of my family. Because, you know, we were taught as an to be independent who we are, um, stay focused on where you come from, what your country is, always remain, you know, have a clear 
um, and continued association with your family. Family is so important. And family is, um, you isolate yourself from family, you know, that can make or break you. And, um, and in, when you separate from that association, yeah, you, you, you basically um, become a lost soul. Um, and when you turn around, you know, in isolation like that there, there's no one there to support you. But when you're around family, you turn around, there's always someone there, you know. And, um, and of course, that's what made it so hard and challenging for a lot of people who were taken away. Fortunately, you know, my family were taken away, my nanas, you know, six of my, na my nana and six of her siblings were taken during the 1920s, 1930s, and um, placed out on these government indentured programs, slave labour, um, approved of by the Crown, but the Crown was enslaving their own children at that time as well and shipping them off to other parts of the world as children, 10, 12 year old children. So, you know, they were cruel and, uh, and inhumane. And those people had to suffer and live just like ours. And so there are comparisons. But the fact is that surviving that and watching your grandparents and watching your parents grow up in that situation um, and you look back on it, you know, you've really got to, you know, give them five star uh, for that, for their efforts, you know, ten stars. And um, you can't say any of them are failures. Anybody who say that people surviving under that time are failures, yeah, um, are heartless people. And, um, you know, you, you survive with what you can. And so, you know, many people say, you know, what's your motivation? There's a very big story um, in terms of my motivation to want to lead some sort of um, revolutionary change uh, for our mob and give back what it is. It's, um, it's built, you know, there's this sense of um, pride that makes me say that it's not going to happen, you know, to, to assimilate. To, assim to assimilate into, into, the, um, into this world because it's, that's not who I am, it's not who we are as a people. And, um, and of course, we all have a right to our own identity. We have a right to a nationality. We have a right um, to exercise rights that are, uh, that are that, that's part of us. Yeah. And, um, and to exercise that and take ownership of it um, yeah, is, a, is, a, is a maximum that, maximum that cannot be ignored. Now, when I got involved in the Black Power Movement, we all knew what we wanted. You know? um, and so coming from a community base, I was not taught some academic um, process that's going to allow to go to revolution. So I'm not a reader of Trotsky, I'm not a reader of, you know, um, of uh, Mao Tse Tung, the little red book. I'm not a reader of, um, you know, anyone who professes revolution. No, I, I, I think for myself, you know. Um, unfortunately, when having studied political science, you know, you start reading all this stuff, you know, your Marxist theories and Plato's and Aristotle's, you know, idealistic world of, you know, a dem dem of democracy. And then the arguments on the other side of, you know, what constitutes dictatorships. And, 
you know, autocratic societies. Um, so all of this, you know, this political jargon and, and theory it comes from people who encourage others to take on board their thinking and go out there and apply it when they've never been able to apply it themselves. And, um, and of course, you know, their writings, their teachings cause them to be, you know, hounded and persecuted. But it's a very different thing when you're out there um, just working from a society where you've been colonised and um, you've been told that you can't think in your language, you can't talk your language, you can't dance your stories, you can't sing your stories. Um, and even to the point where the old people, you know, they stopped the churches, the white churches, stopped having, um, uh, or sorry, refused to have funeral services with Aboriginal people because of the way in which the Aboriginal people wailed at these ceremonies and, and at these uh, funerals. And like Walgett, for example, I can only talk about Walgett, um, but I know the Church of England at Walgett said we're not going to, in the 1930s and 40s, 50s, said we, we're not going to uh, provide any more services um, in the church because we want you to stop bloodletting and, uh, and wailing the way you do. Like, you know, um, this is, you know, the colonizers sort of dictating through the churches when you wanted to bury your own, you know. Um, and so I've seen the records um, dating back to the 1940s where at uh, Corindabri, um, my old uncle Georgie Cumbo, um, who married my grandfather's auntie, Fanny Eckford. Um, old George Cumbo is listed on the government records as conducting traditional ceremonies, funeral ceremonies for his people. And so he buried them culturally. Now, so there's a precedent there, you know, that the government recognised Aboriginal burials and allowed the ceremonial elders to conduct those, uh, those funeral rites for the people. Um, and so when I look at those things, I think to myself, and I always thought to myself, well, you know, knowing that the people used to do this, you know, and the government recognised it, like, where did it all go wrong? Where, where did, when did, when did that stop, you know? And, and it stopped, essentially, because you had Aboriginal people who wanted to fit, you know, like a, a hand in a glove that was designed by the white oppressors for us to have to fit into that, fit our hand into that glove. And, and that's where we began to have our people try to please the white man to the point where he was, in fact, the one who was causing our breakdown. So our own people were assisting in, in breaking down our cultural practices. Yeah. Thinking that, oh, if we do it this way, the white man will be, he'll favour us, he'll be good to us. And of course, you know, um, you know, I, I watched a, I watched a story of Rome going into, going into Britain, yeah. And of course, the the Caesar, the leader of the people, was saying, look, you know, they hate each other so much that we don't have to extend any efforts of our soldiers having to go in and, you know, swing the sword and probably be maimed and killed by attacking them. We just pick out the friendly ones and and send them against the, the, their own mob because they don't like each other. Yeah? So their hate for each other is our greatest weapon.
And of course, that's what happened here. It's, it's very clever. It's a, it's a ploy that the British adopted to use against ours. Our, our, our mob, because they know that our mob are, are only too pleased to be seen to be supporting the powerful one, the one with the money, yeah? and the one who can give you money, the one who can give you status and position, <coughs> and give you power, so that you can have a you know big fancy um, position, um, and all you got to do is just betray your people. So it's 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 um it's hard. It's hard because you get into a position where, you know, I go back, uh, I now come to where my, my father told me, you know, he said, son, you just got to be careful with them when you're dealing with black power and, and your own mob. And his statement was, to me, beware of the two-bob blackfellow, because a two-bob blackfellow will bring you down quick. And when I asked him to explain that, he said, a two-bob black fellow will stand by you, next to you, shout the same slogans as you. But if someone comes up and offer him 30 cents, right, rather than 20 cents, he'll go with that person who offers him 30 cents. Yeah, he'll go with that person who can promise him a, a position or a station in life. Or, he'll turn a blind eye, to the powers that be that is, will turn a blind eye to your wrongdoings if you run interference for them. And so if you run interference, yeah, we'll turn a blind eye. You can. Do whatever you want, that is, supply drugs. So essentially, um, colonization has really mixed a lot of people up. Um, the old protection regimes um, had a lot of people confused as well. Um, Because on the one hand, you know, Aboriginal people, whilst under this constant oppression and dictatorship in terms of their lives, uh, the old people knew who they were and just wanted to do their thing. Whereas the younger ones um, got more caught up in modernity, if we can say that, and what you had then is this whole system where whilst, you know, alcohol wasn't freely available to Aboriginal people, white men liked black women, and of course they brought the grog into the communities, they brought the grog onto the edges where people can get out and about, you know, even though there were fences around missions, you just climb through the fence and go out and sit on the outside of the mission in the gully somewhere and have a drink. Yeah, white men was doing that. Um, but the white men's motives was to go after what they called black velvet. They wanted the black flesh of the women. And they, they did it. In, in a style um, that then you know, made these Aboriginal girls feel important because they were able to have sex with a white man voluntarily or if you can say while being drunk uh, while being drunk is, being, is a voluntary act well, and that's, that's, uh, that's a different ball game altogether um, and of course, you know, I remember learning language and stuff of my grandmother, my dad's mother, and, and my own grandmother, my mother's mother, um, and stories. 
I also um, used to ask the question about, you know, you fellas are you teaching all them fellas too? No, 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 we can't teach them fellas. Why? Why can't you teach? They, you should be teaching them fellas, them young girls, young women, and them other young men. No, no, no. All right. Well, then it took me a while to find out what the what the logic was. You know, what it is that they said, no, we're not going to teach them. It took me a while. And the answer was pretty simple. In regards to the women, my my granny said, you know, them white fellas there, bring them alcohol because they know that those girls are going to put out when they're drunk. They have no resistance. Yeah? All their inhibitions are gone out the door. And so it's alcohol and I'm using the crude language they use was the alcohol open the legs very easy on a girl and so if alcohol does that to a girl and she loses her inhibitions then alcohol will also create loose lips and what comes out of their mouth may be what we don't want them to tell white people. And it's the same with the men. You can't teach ceremony and put a young man through ceremony if he's drinking or on alcohol uh, or drugs. It's the same principle. Because these people, yeah, um, secrets mean nothing when you don't have control of your own mind. Yeah. And so, a lot of things got lost because the pe our own people didn't trust them. Our own people did not trust them. And of course that f overflowed into, you know, the political struggle as well. Yeah. Um, and so all this self-doubt and doubt emerged and it, you know, just came to the surface. And so you had all this distrust and mistrust. And that complicated politics to a large degree because there were challenges all around. And, um, like, our old people were, when I grew up, like, I would, I would you know, I, I guess, you know, being born in that, late 1840s, early 50s period um, meant that you could mix with and talk with people who were born in the 18, late 1880s, 1890s. Yeah? And so when you consider that those people were taught by their grandparents, that meant that those people had knowledge um, that existed there uncorrupted before the white men came into our country. And so a lot of, you know, that knowledge was being lost because of modernity and people not knowing what way they wanted to go. Um, they were always being taught, you know, get in the 60s, you know, Get your mini skirts out and get your, you know, aisle boots and your, your makeup and lipstick and paint up like a white man instead of painting up like a black fellow and probably, you know, and so, so yeah, that that fifties, late fifties, early sixties, for me was a defining period. Um, and, but it was a period that set about confusion as well. Um, so whilst I say it was a defining period, it was a period where inside the person, the individual,
inside the person there could only be one choice out of two at least that's my perception and that was um, as that little image that I fell in love with in America where there was this little two little Indian boys um, on this poster one little fella with his lap lap on and his feather and band around his feather in his hair and his band around his head um, with his moccasin shoes and he'd walking along with another little Indian boy who was dressed up in a school uniform dragging his school bag and one little little Indian fella looked at the well, the caption, the wording in the picture was a little fellow with a feather in his head said, <coughs> um, sorry, the other way around. The schoolboy said, well, you either is or you isn't, referring to their identity. And the little fellow with the feather in, he just simply says, I are. And that, you know, that's very revealing. Sorry, I didn't mean to pop yet. But that's very real, very revealing. And it's something <coughs> that the late 50s and 60s did to a lot of our people, young people. And so that image is revealing. And the caption certainly describes the moment in the 60, late 50s, 60s. Uh, it was about who were you? Um, what side of the fence did you belong? Now, clearly, very few people of that period were saying, or were told, I'm sorry, were told by anyone that there was no need to make a choice. There was no need at all. You could be both. And you could live in both worlds. Yeah. And of course, the only difference will be that in our society, you have to cut yourself off for a period of time from your workplace in the white society for about six weeks during the summer period. So you do ceremony and you learn all the old ancient laws, <clears throat> the customs, the traditions, our beliefs. Now, every other culture in the world does that, does exactly that. You know, mind you, you know, uh, the closest who would come to us would be the Mexicans with their siesta breaks during the day, so Whereas we, on the other hand, you, you have to cut yourself off from work and family, you know, for that three-week, four-week period. Um, and of course, that could, that would be a perfect time where Aboriginal people would develop a uniform approach, whether it be in public and private sector, where that's the period they take their holidays yeah? and they go do ceremony and do business at that time and so I think you know the private sector workplace and the public sector workplace would be able to do that because then you're creating you know some casual work for people to fill your place yeah and I think modernity and especially given, you know, now women have that time off to give birth to children and raise the little children until the crash age and they can put them in crisis and go back to work. So, so they, they've already facilitated that. They've already facilitated. I remember working in the DAA at the time when we were talking about this very thing. 
and so Aboriginal people were then given extended time to go home for funerals. Sorry business. And so it's not as though it was impossible. It wasn't within our grasp or reach. Yes, it was possible. And so in that late 50s, early 60s, th there was this void and no one could say you could have the best of both worlds. And of course, you know, uh, you get into the racist elements within the administration, the oppressive society who says you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, in our case, we could. Yeah. And so, yeah. But the other thing about that period as well, well I always had focus on the fact that Okay, I was doing ceremony, I was learning. I was learning language. And you see, when you learn language and when you learn culture and properly, you do have um, instinctively within you an association with country and culture, but it becomes a reality when you're learning. And you're out there and you're, you're doing things. And so, that sets you apart from people who are sitting there at home just talking about what they'd learned, what they heard. Not what they learned, but what they heard. And so learning on country is very different from sitting in a kitchen or in a backyard drinking alcohol or smoking some type of dope or whatever. And then talking about what they were told as a story, uh, or what they may have read. I'm pausing because of the bumps. So what you read is very different from what you learn, and the real, you know, the, the reality of that existence is a far cry from what you read. And of course, what you read is an interpretation by a, a non-cultural person and someone who comes from a different culture, a different type of background. Even our blackfellas who write books these days, you know, they're writing from a white perspective because their mind has been trained to think white. They don't think in their own language. They don't think in their with a cultural um, background. No, the only culture they know, the only teaching they know, is white concept. And so, when you try and interpret Aboriginal culture from a white perspective, uh, you're no better than a white man who's writing that themselves. You might be able to write with a little bit of emotional differences and um, put a bit of a slight slant on it. Um, but if you have to write like that and appeal to people's emotions to get them to react to what you're writing about, well then that's not the real thing. But again, that's a personal observation. Um, and um, and it's a per and I feel that I have I'm qualified to make those observations because it's very different when you go through ceremony. It's very different when you learn your language and when you're reading what an Aboriginal person writes in their books in terms of culture, etc., and impacts of mission life and being under the rule of thumb, under the protection regime. Well, I grew up, I watched my grandparents, I watched my mother, I watched my uncles, I watched them ruled by those under that system. And so I lived it. And I was a keen observer of that damage. And I listened at the table and at the fires when the old people used to complain about the dominance of these white people. And I come back to what I started, how I started this conversation was 
during that 50s and 60s period, people didn't know where they wanted to be or who they were. And they, they certainly had no idea of the type of person they could be. And that was, that was, all, comp that was all complicated because uh, they felt that there were no other choices. Yeah, the choices were limited. But there was, in fact, a choice of three. Assimilate, learn our ceremony, and walk. And the other one was to learn both worlds and walk in the middle. Um, and unfortunately, in 2020, I know that there are still people you know, in that unknown zone and are still trying to work out who they are, where they are, what they are, where they want to be and who they want to be. And it's, it's damaging. <laughs>